Well, thank you for that uh, really kind introduction, Peggy, and, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for making your way here on a, uh, at least it's a nice sunny and beautiful uh, Friday morning, but early. So have more coffee. I want you all awake. Um, I, I'm so delighted to be here, and uh, being the third speaker, I know I'm in great company. Um, but uh, engaging with uh, the Aspen Institute's Bright Minds is something that I'm just delighted by. Uh, as you heard, I first came here a year ago uh, and met with Walter and, and so many of his colleagues and have enjoyed every interaction I've had with the Aspen Institute. And uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been just thrilled with the interactions we've had and pleased with the opportunity to engage in the kind of dialogue that we're going to have this morning. So. Um, I have to be honest with you to start with, though, as you've heard, I've had this um, unusual career uh, spanning the whole healthcare spectrum. As my parents like to say, at one point I was a real doctor, a clinician. Um, they still are looking for where I put that stethoscope. You know, your parents want you to be there to take care of them and their friends. Um, but I've been a clinician, a cancer researcher, a drug developer, a chancellor of UCSF. And, and honestly, I was drawn to the Gates Foundation because of the money. Um, and uh, uh, no, 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 don't get me wrong. Um, it wasn't my salary. Uh, it was the incredible generosity of Bill and Melinda Gates and, and yes, Warren Buffett too. Um, and what that generosity means is, is that those financial resources um, allow us to make a potentially, and I really emphasize the word potentially, unique contribution to global health and development. Um, we can have grand ambitions. We can have big hopes and dreams. Um, and, and what does that mean? What does that mean for me? And what does that mean, um, hopefully, for the world? So we can take risks that others either can't or won't. And we can have a singular purpose. And we do have a singular purpose, which is to reduce inequity and give everyone the opportunity to lead a healthy, productive life. Um, but in doing so, we can do things in a unique way. Um, the foundation's guiding belief that I really love is that all lives have equal value. All lives have equal value. And that simple but powerful conviction resonates with all of us here. I know all of you, as we meet at the end of really 2015, that's been in this area of thinking a momentous year. So 2015 saw the culmination of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, which without any doubt, I think people consider a resounding success. So why a success? We, we shouldn't declare victory, but the MDGs focused the world's collective attention on some of the most serious challenges we faced at the start of a new century. These MDGs set concrete targets and they enable countries to track and measure progress. And in fact, the MDGs did inspire extraordinary achievements at a pace that was previously unmatched in human history. Now that's, that's pretty good for a set of goals. It's not bad. Now we all know the headlines by now, but they do actually bear repeating. Maternal deaths cut nearly in half. Child mortality and malaria deaths cut by half and extreme poverty cut by more than half. So half, 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 but that means we're still only halfway done. And that's why 2015 is such a seminal year. In 2015, we did the report card on the MDGs, but we also adopted at the recent UN meet meeting the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, where the world came together to commit to finishing the work. And so here's just a few of the objectives that, that in fact our entire world has set for ourselves between now and 2030, the next 15 years. End poverty in all of its forms everywhere. End hunger. Achieve gender equity. End the epidemics of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and neglected tropical diseases. Wow. Did I mention ambitious goals? <laughs> for me, this is one of the greatest legacies of the success of the MDGs, that it's now possible to set ambitious, challenging goals and not be dismissed as a crank. That's really interesting. 
And that's because we now know what's possible with public support and political will. That is the year behind us. And the question going forward is having set these ambitious goals and having had the experience as a globe with the MDGs, how do we make good on the new promises to build a world where every person has the chance for a healthy, prosperous life? What do we do now? So the hard truth, and, and it's really the subject I want to speak to you about this morning, the hard truth is that the current tools and technologies simply aren't going to be enough to get us all the way there. We can't just work harder at achieving that next leap to the next 15 years. We'll need greater investment and greater innovation. But I actually think we need more than that. If we're going to succeed on the SDGs, we need to be far more specific about what needs to be done, who it needs to be done for, and where it needs to be done. In short, we're going to need more precise solutions as we focus ever harder on the areas of greatest need. Now, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this in the last few months as the CEO of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I'm beginning to believe more and more in the need for a radically different approach to tackling global health problems. <coughs> One option has been at the forefront of my mind for some time, and it's what I want to discuss with you this morning. And, and I do hope, as Peggy said, that this is a conversation. It's an idea. It's not a plan. And uh, ideas I like because there's time for input and dialogue and feedback. The idea is this. Can we apply the principles that underpin precision medicine to the global health agenda? Precision. Now that's a word the scientist in me just loves. And so let me give you some more context on the development of precision medicine since I've, I've been privileged to have a front row seat. And as a clinician, researcher, and drug developer, I want you to know when I talk about precision medicine what it means to me. Now, we started this journey of talking about precision medicine talking about personalized medicine, and many of you, you have heard a lot about personalized medicine, the right drug for the right patient at the right time. Precision medicine is just slightly different, although there's some similarities to that. In precision medicine, I think one of the essential ideas is that you gather all the data you can and use all that data to develop a very clear understanding of what will work best for a patient based on the conclusions you draw from that data. It tends to be a group of patients who may benefit most rather than a singular patient. That data will allow you to understand the patient as a member of a subcategory of individuals who will respond particularly well or particularly poorly or have side effects to a specific course of treatment. That subcategory may be 10 million people or 100 people. But the data will allow for a level of precision in treatment that can make an enormous difference for an individual patient and for others with a similar makeup or similar diagnosis or who are similarly affected. Now, my affinity for precision medicine comes from a very special place of purpose. When I did my medical training, I trained as a cancer doctor. I was very unhappy about one thing about being a cancer doctor. One of the things you hear as a medical doctor is the first principle is do no harm. Well, you can imagine as a young doctor, someone coming in to you who looks very well. And after you treat them, they feel well and they feel sick. That would be the opposite of what you hope and dream for as a physician. How the therapies I was using made patients lose their hair, have nausea and vomiting, or even more frightening, suffer from life-threatening infections, and that toll that our aggressive assault on their cancer took on their own normal cells and immune system, I really hated that. I mean, there's no two ways about it. That was not my favorite thing. I don't want to make people feel bad. I want to decrease suffering. I want to fix things. And so when I got to Genentech and started working on Herceptin, there was something really beautiful about it. 
Before that, when I talked to women who had this most difficult form of breast cancer, HER2 positive breast cancer that we all know about now, I knew it was the scariest form of breast cancer. But the great jujitsu of this was turning on its head this risk factor for the most difficult breast cancer and using Herceptin to make it a controllable breast cancer. That was one of the first examples of precision medicine. We could precisely target HER2, the driver of growth of that breast cancer. And when we targeted it with precision, we didn't surprise the surrounding bone, the surrounding healthy cells, so we didn't make people's hair fall out with Herceptin or make them sick to their stomach. Now having a powerful effective cancer drug that didn't have the traditional chemotherapy side effects, there are side effects, but not those side effects that are the, the result of imprecision, that was a special thing for me. And it felt almost like something that was like a miracle that we could actually do that with that precision and that targeting. I couldn't imagine at the time why I wouldn't try hard, literally for the rest of my life, to see if that could be possible for other patients that even outside of cancer, other patients could have that ability to work with their clini clinicians and know themselves that we used all of our power and understanding of what was wrong with them to be as precise as possible about the best remedy for them. When I went to UCSF, I started leading on this concept of precision medicine, and we actually had a good deal of success. And when uh, President Obama talked about the precision medicine initiative, that, that was a pretty fantastic moment for those of us who think this is a special way to think about this field. But, but frankly, when I arrived at the Gates Foundation, now more than 18 months ago, I thought I had left that all behind. Because like most people, for me, precision medicine seemed most consistent with sequencing, genetics, high cost medicine for cancer, and other diseases that afflict people in rich countries. That was kind of rich people medicine. And a light then went on. And the longer I've been at the foundation, I, I, I want to come back to what I mentioned before. Our guiding belief at the foundation is that all lives have equal value. And I still care passionately about helping people avoid suffering. That motivation hasn't left me in this change of jobs. So here's what I think. I, I think it's not fair or right or really all that pragmatic that low resource countries or poor countries historically haven't benefited from the same innovations as all of us. That's not fair. That's why I'm increasingly both intrigued and interested in asking the question about whether a precision approach can be brought to bear on the issues we're trying to solve at the foundation. So what if you were to take great science great technology, big data, and all the smarts in the world to try and reduce inequity and human suffering on a global basis. Surely you can use the lessons from precision medicine to map a future for detecting, controlling, and combating infectious diseases everywhere, especially those infectious diseases that affect the poor. Or to ensure that more children and young people survive and thrive. Or even to empower the poorest especially women and girls, to transform their lives. So it's an approach that I'm starting to call precision public health. And we're increasingly beginning to develop this concept at the foundation. How could precision public health work? Is that, what does that even mean? So let me just take a, a compelling example of the lymphatic filariasis triple drug therapy. Now that's a huge opportunity, a real potential advance in the treatment or even elimination of a certain neglected tropical disease that places a big burden on a small number of communities, cause, causes elephantiasis, that if you've ever seen pictures or heard this, very dramatic and very disturbing. If you apply what's called mass drug administration, you give out drugs broadly, <laughs> in certain vulnerable areas, that's actually got side effects that are not good. You could cause blindness. So what's between you and a magnificent new way to wipe out this terrible disease is a potential side effect. If you want to take advantage of this opportunity, you have to know 
from a community level how to treat precisely to avoid this blinding complication. Because it's only people with a certain additional neglected tropical disease that you have to avoid treating. That's, that's precision targeting of communities where you know you could be effective. That's a little bit different way to think about precision. But that knowledge of what afflicts those patients could allow you to wipe out this terrible condition with mass drug administration, a very effective public health targeting. So I think that's really exciting. That's really interesting. Now, at the start of this talk, I mentioned the incredible progress that we've seen against child mortality. We have big aspirations for even greater progress over the next 15 years. Yet whenever you look at a pie chart, so what would you ask if you were trying to solve under five mortality and double the progress over the next 15 years? You would say, well, what are the causes of death? What's, what's left behind? We've solved some problems, others are left. If you look at that pie chart, there's a big slice, about 40% of that pie chart, and it's labeled neonatal. Now, you guys are all really smart, right? That's why you're here at 8.30 in the morning. <laughs> Is neonatal a cause of death? I don't think so. That's a time. It, it reminds me in medicine of when we say idiopathic. It's a very bad sign when it says idiopathic. And it's actually a bad sign when it says neonatal. That's nothing more than an adjective to describe babies in their first month of life. What neonatal really means is we have no idea. If we're ever going to achieve our ambition to make sure that more children survive and thrive, we don't just need to know that babies are dying in the first 30 days of life. We need to know why babies are dying in the first 30 days of life. Now let me give you an example. Say you have a condition like strep B, a bacterial infection. Many of the babies who perish from strep B in low-income countries would all be counted under that dreadful neonatal category or maybe perinatal death or even stillborn. The point is that no one, and most especially the parents, would have known that the death was due to group B strep. Why does that matter? The next pregnancy would go on with a seven-fold risk, increase in risk of strep B for that next pregnancy. And here's the thing. Everything could change by simply giving the mother penicillin during her next pregnancy. It's hard to think of a cheaper or safer prevention than that, penicillin. But no one's going to suggest it if we don't know that it's strep B in the first place. Just imagine the progress we could make on newborn health if we truly had the power of data at our disposal in dealing with this absolutely fundamental global health challenge. As a partial response to this challenge, our foundation is supporting the development of the Child Health and Mortality Prevention Surveillance, or CHAMPS, network. <coughs> This program will establish six sites in Africa and South Asia over its first three years, and these sites will collect comprehensive, standardized primary data addressing all causes of death in children under the age of five, including through the use of minimally invasive tissue sampling. Our ambition is that the CHAMPS network will grow to more than 20 sites over the next two decades, and we've already committed $73 million to make that happen over the next three years. But we estimate that this will cost more than twice that much, about $150 million. So we're looking to other partners to participate in this with us. It's really a practical and effective investment to make more precise our understanding of this causes of death in the first 30 days. That way we can direct our global spending on this issue, neonatal deaths, with ever greater precision. Now, in a similar fashion, we recently launched a new grand challenge around putting women and girls at the center of the development agenda. And we believe, and Melinda Gates has been a great global champion of this, that this involvement of women and girls is critical to global progress. But here's the thing. There's a lot of programs, and you all know about them, that seek to improve gender equality and empowerment. But what we desperately need in this area is better understanding of how to do this most efficiently and under what conditions the various approaches will be most effective. We need data. We need better understanding. And that's why we focused the grand challenge on developing and testing solutions and generating evidence for approaches 
especially on how to promote equitable decision making that are sustainable, cost effective, and with potential for scale. So precision public health then is all about looking at that child mortality chart, recognizing that categorizing deaths as neonatal is simply unacceptable. But it's also about talking about empowering women and girls is, is futile. If you don't know what empowerment really is to individuals in their unique circumstances or how you achieve it on the ground, what works. Only once we chip away at our own ignorance will we be able to build real, lasting, portable solutions. So if we're serious about those SDGs, if we're serious about those ambitions, we'll have to devote the best minds, latest technology, and the most robust science to solving the big global health problems. And I believe very much that the same tools that helped create targeted therapies for an individual's genetic makeup could potentially be harnessed for this endeavor to ultimately help entire populations. In this way, precision public health adds a layer of equity to precision medicine. Taking what we can do for an individual patient and applying it to a population or a community. Because it really irritates me when people, even people who care a lot about public health, wall off large avenues of innovation for being utilized makes me impatient. Poor people don't get the good stuff. I mean, that just feels, like I said, unfair. For me, when I try and spend any time on this, I come back to what really gets me fired up. If you are in a low resource area and you're suffering from anything that may range from HIV to diarrheal disease, all of our best assets should be brought to bear on solving the problem that's affecting you and your community. And precision public health could bring every scientific tool to bear, sequencing, molecular biology, database disease surveillance, to create better remedies, better diagnostics and biomarkers, and better therapeutics. In other words, let's take the gift of technology and apply them to problems in low and middle resource countries. But it's actually more than that. It's also about using those technologies in ways that take account of local contexts and the needs of specific often impoverished communities. And for that, you need to rely on data, lots of data, fast, real-time data, the kind of data that requires serious upfront investment and a sustained commitment over time. So if we want to move faster and better, we actually need to share the data faster and better. So we should create an entire community globally that has open access to this data as a shared global good. That could bring more opportunities for people who aren't part of the traditional scientific community to help find solutions to the challenges we face. This could be something radically different and interesting, way beyond thinking, it's mine, I want to patent it, I want to publish it, and until then, nobody touches it, which frankly would be a seismic shift. But imagine the progress we could make and, and actually, I'm not being dreamy. There's a template for this. In 2011, I co-chaired with Charles Sawyers of Memorial Sloan Kettering, a National Academy of Sciences committee that recommended creating a data network aimed at developing more diagnostics and treatments tailored to individual patients. We called for a network of knowledge that integrates the wealth of data emerging on the molecular basis of disease with information on environmental factors and patients' electronic health records. The vision is to enable basic scientists to mine and manipulate that data in order to explore common molecular mechanisms across illnesses and test their hypotheses about the causes of diseases. Clinicians could tap into the network to learn about the latest findings, inform their diagnoses, and enrich their treatment approaches. So what's to say we couldn't adopt a similar method for treating the diseases in low-income countries? And why wouldn't we want to? In our ever more connected world, a health crisis anywhere can become a health crisis everywhere. Now, I know you heard from Dr. Frieden, so you know that with the Ebola epidemic, we saw this. But we're also seeing it in the refugee crisis that has torn millions of people from their homes and compelled them to gather in camps and makeshift towns. 
The public health consequences of this became apparent with the appearance of wild type polio. Those cases happened among Syrian refugees in late 2013. We're not talking history here, 2013. With populations in flux and national borders in many places more porous, infectious diseases of the poor represent a practical health interest for everyone, as well as an abiding moral interest. As Bill Gates wrote in his New England Journal of Medicine article in April, the Ebola outbreak needs to serve as a warning of the potential destructiveness of future epidemics that could spread far more rapidly and far more widely. Now, I'm not trying to suggest to you this morning that the concept of precision public health is fully formed. That's why I'm eager to draw you into the conversation. I'm mindful that this approach is not without risks. I do think, for instance, that the more you use big data or tracking or monitoring, and I try not to use the word surveillance, which has become a bad word, even though as an epidemiologist it's hard for me to stop. I'll call it disease tracking. I think that's a safer word. It raises for people a creepy factor. It does, even when you don't use the word surveillance. And a privacy issue, very importantly. And I'd like to know how much that raises red flags for all of you here. I'm not sure there's an answer yet um, beyond the obvious. It's a legitimate concern and you need to ensure you have the right levels of protection. You need to think about privacy and you need to think about people and their confidentiality and their and their family's data. But remember what I said at the outset about being at the Gates Foundation. We should be able to take risks that others can't or won't. Calculated, thoughtful, collaborative risks working with partners. And if the Gates Foundation can put this idea out there, have a dialogue and get feedback, I think that we can have a really good dialogue about how much we could create progress with this much more open data-oriented approach. And I think, and in fact I'm convinced, that there's a case to be made for adopting a precision approach to global health. And the more we have ambitious goals, like the SDGs, the more we'll require these novel approaches if we're really serious about ending disease, ending poverty. The potential for populations that I see is as special as the potential I've seen for individual patients with precision medicine, that it can be a game changer. And I find that prospect incredibly exciting. When you see a whole field of medicine change, you believe that actually things can change faster and more effectively than you ever dreamt. And that's actually what makes me an impatient optimist. I'm fascinated to know what all of you think. So again, I really appreciate your coming out early on a Friday morning, and I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you very much. We're going to open the floor to questions and answers, and I believe we have a microphone. Uh, so yeah, Sarah's got the mic right in the back, and so if you'd like to go ahead, please stand up, tell us your your name, and yes, please. Hi, so Deborah Lappin, good to see you today. Nice. Thank you. Do you see in your uh, thinking any room for non-communicable diseases, and in particular, the WHO had its first meeting looking at the worldwide epidemic of Alzheimer's? and how it affects in a really disproportionate way communities that view dementia as a curse of some sort and ostracizing individuals. It's, it's becoming, as we have successfully allowed ourselves, to all communities to grow older, a, an epidemic. And I, I hear you speak so effectively on infectious disease, but I'd like to comment on that. Yeah, well, thanks for the question um, about uh, non-communicable diseases. L let me say two things. Um, the first one is, is just from a foundation point of view. We focused on infectious disease um, for a couple of reasons. One is in the low resource countries where we focus on and with our equity lens, preventable infectious diseases, you know, no child should die, die of a vaccine preventable disease. That, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. So our targeting of infectious diseases, we continue to feel very, very positive about. We think that's good. It's also not an area where for-profit companies 
like the margins. So it is a unique role for the foundation to be focused on particularly vaccine preventable infectious diseases and making more infectious diseases vaccine preventable. That's efficient, it's effective, it's a great um, way for us to make a huge impact on global uh, health. Increasingly, the world is, is anxious about um, non-communicable diseases. And I think that, that a precision public health approach could be a beautiful thing. And, and let me tell you why. One of the challenges with um, <coughs> non-communicable diseases is all too often we struggle because the, we're trying to treat them once they've occurred. There's a lot of young populations that are aging uh, and as incomes grow in low and middle income country, aging is more common, which is good, right? If you live longer, but the tobacco use, dietary habits, exercise, a lot of stuff we talk about a lot in this rich country are some of the hardest things to tackle in medicine. One of the most intriguing aspects for me of of this data-driven approach is whether or not we can use data and feedback and networks, whether they be real networks in your community or your social network virtually, we know your social network drives your behavior in a positive or negative way. So I'm very positive about using more technology and more innovation at a community level to drive behavior change. Now that's gonna be more effective for things like tobacco control, diabetes prevention, hypertension control um, than Alzheimer's. I think Alzheimer's is, is much more at the level of a research question. We don't know the etiology of Alzheimer's, um, but I do think for many of the preventable chronic disease conditions that uh, precision public health holds enormous promise. Thank you. Um, my name is Paula Gordon. I have a very nice to meet you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of uh, websites that are pertinent to what we've been talking about. One of them is called GordonEbolaImmunity.com, and the other is GordonDrugAbusePrevention.com. Now, the Ebola one is pertinent because I'm wondering if there could be a complementary type of uh, approach taken with regard to your precise uh, precision approach, which would be more generalizable um, and focus on such things as uh, the immune status in general systemic health. Because, uh, for instance, Nigeria had very low incidence of lowest incidence of Ebola. Uh, and the difference between that country and, say, Sierra Leone was major differences in the general systemic health of the immune community. Uh, the other uh, area that I'm very deeply concerned about is the, the global uh, drug problem, and uh, including <coughs> marijuana, which has been shown with the highest THC content to have very destructive effects on the central nervous system from uh, in conception through uh, uh, early uh, uh, through the development stages of uh, the brain, which can go as long well as. Uh, Age 29. Do you have a question you can share with Dr. Hellman? Yes, I wonder to what extent um, you are concerned about both the general system itself, the immune, immune status, as well as the spreading drug problem <coughs> and the longitudinal studies which have now shown that one in six become addicted to marijuana use and one in ten adults become addicted to one in six uh, youth. So it's two questions. Um, on, on your first question about Ebola, I think the, the precision public health approach is perfect for Ebola, um, including the important question you ask about um, going beyond. Remember, there was less than 3,000 cases in the world of Ebola um, before the outbreak that started last year. So we as a public health community and the infectious disease community had very, very limited good data on the epidemiology, the transmission, the role of the immune system. We're just learning about different places in your body where Ebola may, may uh, uh, come back. So there's an enormous amount of learning that can be done on Ebola, and the, both in terms of the disease tracking, why certain populations may be at different risk, 
what public health measures were effective, what was less effective, and how that relates to transmissibility and immunity. So I, I, and I know much of this is being done locally and globally through CDC and other institutions. So th that's a perfect example of where precision is going to help us learn and be more ready, including with better diagnostics, therapeutics, and most importantly, better understanding of Ebola. It's the perfect situation for the approach I just outlined. So thank you for asking me that question. I am not an expert on drug abuse, so I, I don't have a good answer for your question because that's just not something I, I'm technically competent in. So uh, I'll pass on that second question. Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions in a row so we can make sure everyone has a chance. Um, uh, I think this gentleman here and this gentleman here um, and the woman in the red. Let's just take three questions. And okay, we'll great. I'm Trent Nichols. I'm a neurogastrologist and did hepatology for the last year and a half at the VA. And one of the things I became aware of is the huge, anywhere from one to two billion population is going to have hepatitis B or getting hepatitis B, transplacental. And as you know, it's a DNA virus. It, it, it actually incorporates into our own nuclear DNA. Uh, there's a company that's doing some research on it, but one of the things we discovered is that you can actually do some very simple things to prevent maybe the liver cancer in the meantime, and actually high dose vitamin D for those that are in equatorial Africa. And also doing a, we have three, uh, fatty acids, which are very helpful in preventing any model of a mouse model of hepatitis B, which goes on to liver cancer. And I'm just hoping that something like that gets picked up because it's, it's estimated at least two billion people in, a, in the world will have hepatitis B. Great example. Let's hold that. Yes, and then the gentleman right here, and the pink, and then the woman in the red. Hi there. My name is Russell Libby. I'm a pediatrician, actually here in Northern Virginia. And of course, first I want to thank the Gates Foundation for their support of the vaccination and all of the. Uh, let's say the unreasonable information on the internet, it really helps here with our own patients. Um, you know, <laughs> you're given a talk that's opening a book with lots of new and empty pages. So there's so many questions you can ask, but one of the things that I see evolving over the next 15 years, which is how you look at this project, is the role of the microbiome. And when you look at farming practices, you look at, uh, at nutrition and other elements uh, that have so much influence on disease and the spread of disease and the susceptibility to disease. Is that part of your forward thinking perspective and, and how would you implement that? And then we have the woman in the red. Which, which woman in the red? <laughs> Everybody has red on. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Jackie Watson. I'm a family medicine physician. I work in the public health space. And um, I'm curious to learn from you what role, if any, um, have you, what has the social determinants of health played in the whole issue of precision public health? So th th uh, uh, the three questions, let me start with hepatitis B. First of all, vaccine preventable disease. Let's, let's start with the most important point I would make on hepatitis. I, I really just want to both reinforce uh, two aspects of your question. One is, in those cases, a vaccine preventable disease, we should be preventing it. The, the second one is I do think there are, um, we don't do cancer at the Gates Foundation, but we're really positive about HPV now and preventing cervical cancer because having vaccine preventable cancers ultimately and hep hepatocellular carcinoma and cervical cancer are not just vaccine preventable infectious diseases but ultimately vaccine preventable cancers. I think that's a really important public health um, fact and we should take advantage of that. I think beyond that once somebody is infected thinking about maximizing their chances to lead a healthy productive life is, is absolutely on point. And so I would just endorse those kinds of trials and knowledge and understanding. And again, the right data framework hopefully could make that a very efficient process. So, so I, I think that's important. If you can't prevent it, then minimizing the downside consequences, I agree with. We're completely intrigued about the microbiome, um, like many scientists. Um, and it's early days, but we are gonna get a lot smarter on microbiome. So let me give you um, two answers to the microbiome question. Uh, answer number one is, yes, a precision public health approach allows you to incorporate that data set. And I think that the scientists that, that I know who are working on the microbiome are increasingly gonna take this literally just amazing massive data and it needs to be brought down to something that is 
if, you, if you're a clinical trials person, you need to have something that you can use as a variable. You know what I mean? That's, I, I can't use a thousand or a million or a billion data points on my microbiome to judge anything. So it's going to have to be like in quartiles or different um, uh, flavors and, you know, it's going to need to be brought down into something where we can make some conclusions. The most important um, and exciting microbiome work I've heard since I've been at the foundation is in our program to understand stunting and wasting. So it, it, the, the importance of the microbiome, the importance of water sanitation and hygiene in whether or not if you, if you have undernutrition, whether you get stunting and wasting, may connect back in some ways to your microbiome. That's a really interesting and important observation, and we want to deeply understand that because that's a, a huge issue, and there's differential outcomes in India and Sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm giving you just like a little flavor of a lot of um, important science. So really important and very, um, I, I'm, I am extremely optimistic that in the next decade we're going to be a lot smarter. So social determinants of health are, um, are one of the reasons why I'm excited about a precision public health message. So I, I don't know what to do about social determinants of health in terms of thinking about how we scale that, how we look at that, how we integrate that into how we think. You know, we do education in the U.S. That's our focus on equity in the U.S. Um, and, and I've actually been talking to the folks at, at Robert Wood Johnson about where we've focused on education, what the school districts are that we work in, and could we look at what the health outcomes are in those communities. I mean, that's just a really interesting way of thinking about that. So one of the things I think we'll need, if those of us um, who are very laser focused on education want to look more broadly at, at social determinants of outcome, uh, so to speak, and if health people want to look at social determinants of health, because we're really all looking at, at what, what are the ways to stack the deck on people thriving, right, in a positive way. We need better tools. We need better technical understanding of how we measure and deeply have rigorous data and evaluations on behavior and social sciences. And so part of my enthusiasm for precision public health is I think we can drive those data elements and work with experts in the field to, to up the rigor and up the tools we have on measuring and working with communities on those social determinants of health. One of the challenges, and I, I think it would be great to, to um, have you and others think about this and help with this because we need help. One of the challenges I have is as a clinical scientist in working on issues like social determinants of health or women and girls and, and gender, um, we, the world, we, the globe, can't make a customized approach one community at a time. Now, you know, people talk about cultural competence and working with the community. I'm, I totally get that and, and having the community drive their future, but if that doesn't scale. If a community says, okay, and, and we hear this in education here in the U.S., we know how to teach our kids. Okay, if you know how to teach your kids, not even at a district, but at a school, um, it, how do you learn, how do you improve, and how does that scale? And so the social determinants of health question I have is, if that's a, if that's a bespoke remedy community by community, it, it, it's, you know, I'm a cancer doctor, so we had at one point, we had this, this way we treated lymphoma, that every single patient got their own antibody. It was done at Stanford, it was actually great. I, I heard for years about the one patient who was cured because they made a special antibody just for her. And I thought, wow, I wanna cure somebody. <laughs> like, that's why I became a cancer doctor. The, the beautiful thing about the antibodies we made when I was at Genentech was we made an antibody that targeted an engine all lymphoma patients with this kind of lymphoma had. That's, I mean, that may be a stupid analogy, but that's really how I feel with the, the work on social determinants and community. I don't want to make one solution one community at a time. I want to have my antibody equivalent so there can be some global goods that we can spread around. And so that's where we need your help and the help of colleagues in this area to say, what, what's going to scale? 
And that's where I think this data and methods, and I mean, it may sound dull, but I think it's essential to scale and, and spreading good practices and what works. And we, we have a lot of questions, so let's do that again where we're taking through. I feel like I'm favoring this side of the room, but, but this okay. gentleman's been- So if you're over here and you have red on, you're all, you're all good. <laughs> <laughs> and then the one red, and then this woman over here, and then someone, you should Yeah, and you do have a red tie. <laughs> So, so I'm hurting my, my, my sprinkle, but um, so in response to your, I'm, I'm Jeannie, I'm with Lily, um, and I just want to kind of go back to your original request that we have start a dialogue on this mm -hmm. idea that you put out there, so I think it's really interesting. And I think when you think about this actually putting this practice or moving forward in the dialogue around this idea of open, yeah. shared data, to better understand, well, there's a lot of data out there now, and people, and, and it's huge, there's, huge big data, right? So why not? Why not? And I think the one point you made that I think might be the challenge or obstacle is the creepy factor, right? Mm -hmm. So in thinking about, you know, I want to ask, how, how would you socialize this a little bit more? Um, because the big, I, I think about things that are going on in Europe with privacy and just that's just, you know, stuff on the internet that mm -hmm. people sort of like, you know, voluntarily gets out right. there. So this is so much more, you know, per, you know personalized. Yep. And, um, ha, have you socialized at all in any of the countries that you do work in this idea? Um, what has been the response? And I would say, thinking forward, would, you would probably want to pilot mm -hmm. and, and gain that, um, that support, local support and consent, and then demonstrate the outcomes um, to be able to then further socialize it going forward. So that's just a few comments. Yeah, no. Good. Let's take these people in the way and then. This woman right here in the head. She does have red on. I'm Jessica Lucas. I work for the U.S. Global Development Lab, USA. And I've heard you talk a lot about surveillance, but I've heard you talk within communities. And I think of my work with community surveillance and the challenges there. I'm thinking about some of the um, epidemiology and other networks that exist, um, the ones I'm most familiar with here in South Africa. But can you talk a little bit about the importance or the need for capacity building for education, for training, and how that plays a role in your strategic thinking around chance and other programs in terms of data scientists, in terms of epidemiologists, in terms of the types of skills, knowledge, and competencies that would be needed mm -hmm. uh, at a local level and sustainably in order to see this. We could give this a day long seminar. <laughs> I'm, my name is Ross Sylvester with PBS News Now. Um, I have two uh, short questions. Um, back to the part about we can't have a customized approach for every community, but um, so does that mean we go from country to country, continent to continent? So like, how do we customize it to make sure it's broad enough that anyone for a cure for, I don't know, AIDS or tuberculosis can have access to it? And then um, the other question is, what is a specific example of a country that your foundation has worked in where women's empowerment and girls' empowerment has helped with uh, public health? So let me start with a creepy question. Um, <laughs> I've thought about this a lot. Um, and when I was chancellor at UCSF, we had a summit when the Precision Medicine um, uh, report came out from the National Academy of Sciences. And because we were in California, we called it OM, as in microbiome and uh, um, as in ohm chanting, because you know uh, all you guys think everybody in California is yeah. The, there was no meditating at the conference, but it was terrific, and we engaged community leaders and the public in this discussion, and and it was a global crowd and tech leaders, and so it was it was the perfect forum to have a discussion about the issue you raise. So so there were two ideas. So the the, the answer is I don't know. I particularly don't know how to fix this in Europe because they're, they're extremely concerned about this. 
But the two things that resonated for me, and again, it gets back to community-driven kinds of things. If, if you are in a community, and you've all been in communities before where there's a child who needs a bone marrow donor or somebody who needs a match or something like that, it's not about something creepy. It's about solving a problem for somebody you love or your community loves. It, if we're trying to solve a problem and we do a better job of articulating the problem we're trying to solve and why we're asking you to share your data, then the second idea comes up, which is people volunteer. Remember this terrible Boston Marathon thing and how they had to stop people from going and donating blood? And, and again, I'm talking America now, okay, but we're in Washington, D.C., so I'm allowed to do that. There's this spirit of being a volunteer, a blood drive. It, I think we need to think more uh, in the, uh, starting with the precision medicine area, but increasingly going to the precision public health, about tapping into people's compassion and spirit of being a volunteer. And I do think if you told me, okay, Sue, and you know, I'm a, a person whose background is in breast cancer. If you and your four sisters donate your genome to this project, we're gonna increase our chances of solving breast cancer. Oh, I'm calling up my sisters. I'm telling you, because then I'm helping solve a problem and I'm a volunteer. So, so then you've got to say, okay, is somebody gonna make money off of this? How are you gonna protect my data? But I do think the, the compassion and spirit of volunteerism and, and, and in, increasingly, if there is money to be made, I bring up, and, and I think we should bring up, if, if somebody's gonna make a profit, are you gonna pay me? You know, so I'm either a volunteer, and, and so I do buy into the concept that I own my data, but I can also, in owning my data, contribute my data to a greater good, to compassion, to solving problems that my neighbors have. So I think there's a whole aspect here that's that, um, that we should tap into. On the skill sets, boy, do I agree with you. Um, but here's where I think we need to start. So I'm gonna make it harder, not easier. And I think we do need to make it harder because the, the, I learned a lot about what was reality on electronic health records, okay? Because I had a dream and the dreams not come true. <laughs> no, the dream was this is gonna make everything easy. And in fact, the, the reality is this is gonna make everything hard. So. So the, if we want this to work, we should challenge ourselves that CHAMPS, disease surveillance, getting ready for the next pandemic, all this stuff, that the Minister of Health in every country and the public health departments or their homologue in every country, the data needs to be the data. So the same data that us dweeby people look at you know, on our computer in Washington, D.C. or Seattle, Washington, are the information that people who are decision makers in that country use to drive outcomes. And, and, and then we need to have skill sets and talent and capabilities in country because it's that country's data and that community's data. And, and I think that's exciting because I think the world's changing and I think that there's more talent than we're tapping into. It makes it harder and maybe slower, but better. So I think that's what we need to challenge ourselves to do. So I, I know I didn't solve your problem, I made it harder, but we, the lesson learned is you can't go too fast. Because um, if you go too fast, at least this is my personal lesson on EHR, that the, the portability piece of it and shareability piece, you have to nail that even if you add two years. I mean, I just, this is complete um, Monday morning quarterback, but you know, Friday morning quarterback. And your two questions about communities. So the, okay, so you're asking me to remember two more. The, the, uh, the, women. Um, the first one was um, if you can't have a, a customized. Um, oh, a, a, a customized bespoke solution for each one. Yeah. What level should you go and like how far do you go with customization? Got it. And then the women and girls. So, the, so, so let me start with the women and girls. So Melinda and I went to Malawi and we saw this incredible program, uh, Care Pathways program with smallholder farmers, and it had a nutrition element in it and a lot of education and teaching about what uh, your child needed, exclusive breastfeeding, and, um, and then had this element of how the women could do savings and use that savings for health and education and agency in the end. It was profoundly changing that community. And I will tell you, I have to tell a short story because we're, <laughs> 
my favorite part of that visit was not just this twinkle in the eye of all the women and their stories and what it meant to them and their families, but the men insisted in setting up their own self-help group <laughs> because they pointed out, we're seeing people getting fat, having money, and thriving. Why is this only for women? And you know, that seemed to me a really good prognostic sign. <laughs> that, was, that was the most fun. That was really good. It, here's the thing, I don't, I, I don't want you to misinterpret my comment about y you can't customize community by community as being like it's okay to be culturally incompetent or come in as you know the, the Gates Foundation or USAID or whoever you're coming in as. It, what Ebola taught us, think about safe burials. Ebola taught us that there's a thought leader in every community and that thought leader was believable and the community trusted that person and that that's where you needed to go to say, okay, you know, w we need to talk about safe burials. It's a really important transmitter of Ebola, and, and that's something that we need to work with you and your colleagues in the community to get done. So I, I think those are insights that are unbelievably important and precious. I like things that scale. I like vaccines, and I like, I like medicines, because I can give you that medicine in Peru and I can give you that medicine in Tanzania, and I can give you that medicine in, in Paris, okay? What, what I'm trying to figure out is, and it may be a toolkit, it may be an approach. It, isn't, it, it doesn't necessarily need to be like a Fitbit or a device or a thing, but, but I'm looking for something that if I'm, the, if I'm the government in a nation, and we're increasingly, somebody brought up Alzheimer's, we're increasingly facing um, an increased healthcare burden based on X. I would love to be able to say, wow, that community did these things. Now, my community is different, but here are three crucial elements that I need to incorporate in my community approach that are proven and I can use for me. And if, if, if we say, oh no, it can't be done, every community is, it, you start fresh, wow. I'm overwhelmed. So, so everything from exclusive breastfeeding to uh, how you care for your baby, I'd love for us to, to push ourselves to say, can we solve those issues to maximize health in one community? Wh what is the global good that we can create that other communities can use? And the more that we can transport that as broadly as possible, that's just an efficiency measure. Um, I wish we could stay all day. <laughs> this makes me want to do an Aspen Public Health Brown Round seminar series where we could all get comfortable and we could do reading ahead of time. And um, I, I just want to take a moment to say, Sue, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think you've given us all a lot of hope, and we are so glad you're at the helm of the Gates Foundation you. and you're a partner to us all. I want to take a minute to introduce my colleague, Ruth Katz. She's the head of our Health Medi Medicine and Society program. We lured Ruth here uh, to the Phoenix School of Public Health at, at George Washington. She was at the Yale School of Public Health, and she now leads my, the sister program here with my domestic health, and we, we run up, and I just thought I'd like to get help down Ruth, could you join us? You stole all my work. Oh, that's okay. I know everybody's got to get out particularly soon, but I am going to take a moment, and I get the opportunity to say a lot of thank yous to Today. But I am going to start again, Sue, with thanking you. Um, unfortunately, it sounds like you, you had a dream with electronic, electronic medical records that did not come true. We had a dream a year ago that you would come to Grand Rounds. <laughs> 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 Thanks so much and have a good Friday.